So I just think that this in-person communications, I think people see it in their personal relationships as well, where you see people's body language. And frankly, you have a little bit of unrelated chit chat to soften the conversation can really be dramatically more impactful than doing a session on Zoom. Hello, I'm Michael Hainsworth. The CIBC Innovation Banking Podcast explores the world of startups, growth stage companies, and late stage companies that have made a big splash in their industries around the world. How do you accelerate software revenue growth and profits post-pandemic? As every startup entrepreneur and growth stage enterprise CEO knows, it's all about scaling up the company. And that typically requires a cash infusion. And that's where Devin Perrick comes in. He's the managing director at Insight Partners and has been with the firm for more than 22 years. Buddy Media was acquired by Salesforce and Media Mind was sold to DG Fast Channel after the IPO. The global investor with fingers and pies in Europe, Israel, China, India, and Latin America says he's looking for the best software companies globally. So how do you define that? And where is he looking today? Yes, you know, it's been interesting because uh, obviously COVID stopped all of us from traveling. And one would have thought that would have meant that we were going to look at deals that were closer and closer to where we were. And interestingly, the opposite has happened. So while we're continuing to do deals that are close to us, you know, my last call today was with a company in Africa. Over the last two years, we've done over 15 deals in India, uh, which we had not really done pre-COVID. We've done a deal in the Philippines. We've done a deal in Indonesia. So I think we're what COVID really did is because we communicate with everybody by Zoom, uh, whether you're 10,000 miles away or 50 miles away, it actually ended up being the same experience. That's just kind of an interesting trend that happened during COVID that I never would have predicted. That being said, what do the best companies have? What are the common characteristics? You know, that really hasn't changed. That hasn't really changed because of COVID. One, we're looking for very large markets. Uh, that's probably probably the most important thing that we look for. We're primarily investing uh, at, at kind of the mid to growth stage, but you know, increasingly going earlier as well. But whether you're going at a growth stage or going at an early stage, having a large market to go after is, is really important. The second thing we look for is a moat from a technology standpoint that what the company's doing, you know, it's hard to do and it's hard to replicate. Uh, that makes it harder for competitors to. Uh, replicate what, what it is you're doing. The third we look for is momentum, um, that customers are actually buying the product and buying more of it. I, we like to joke the dogs are eating the dog food. You know, fourth, uh, and th th these aren't meant to be in order, is great teams. Um, you know, fundamentally, we're, we're looking for great management teams, great founders who truly have a passion for the problem that they're solving. You don't always get all of them, but when you do it, it's really special. Tell me about that technology moat. How do you know whether or not any given company you're looking to invest in has a moat wide enough to stave off the competition? Well, look, you never know. You never know for sure. Uh, that's why it's venture. If it was, uh, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But I think that um, we obviously spend a lot of time talking to customers. Uh, that's probably some of the most important diligence that we do. We have a team that actually assesses the technology and can kind of make some judgments about how difficult it is. You know, the thing that we probably don't put a lot of value in is, you know, patents and things like that. I mean, we think there's always a different way to get to the same problem. So we put, we don't put a lot of stock in that. We put stock in is fundamentally how difficult is the problem to solve and how easy would it be for somebody else to solve it? Now, sometimes what you'll find in a, say in a vertical solution, is that it's not just enough to understand the technology, but you also have to understand the vertical. There's a lot of process around a vertical and understanding how it operates in order to put that into the application. Um, so sometimes the intellectual property isn't just in, I'll call the code. Uh, it can also be in the complexity of a process. Sometimes people think of mode as just how many lines of code, uh, but that's not always, you can have a lot of lines of code and not necessarily have it be difficult to replicate. Uh, you know, sometimes it's the complexity of the code, but oftentimes it's the complexity of the process that you're solving and understanding the industry dynamics can be just as important uh, as lines of code. You've been quoted as saying that you like to be flexible in a deal that you build for any given startup. How do you determine what the best deal actually looks like? 
Well, generally, they'll tell you. Um, you know, I think we'll, when we say that we want to be flexible, what we mean is we don't have a fixed view of what a deal that Insight does has to look like, meaning we do minority deals, we do majority deals, we don't have a set ownership uh, percentage that we have to own. You know, we own as little as, you know, three, four percent of companies and we own as much as 100 percent of companies. What we want to do is we want to find the best companies in the most interesting markets with the best teams and partner with them in a way that makes sense for them. So does that make you a growth at any price kind of guy? <laughs> no. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about valuation and obviously there's been a lot of volatility in the markets. You know, we have a line internally that one of my partners says, you know, we never overpay. Companies just miss our numbers. And we kind of say it jokingly, but really what we're what is embedded in that comment is that when something's growing at a very fast rate, 100 percent or or north, you can pay. And look, I never like to say you can pay any price, but you can pay a pretty high price and make that math work because the multiple is literally having every year. So if you paid X times revenue, the next year is 0.5 times revenue. The year after that is 0.25 times revenue. So people always ask about price, but really what they should ask me about is what's the sustainable growth rate? And where we've been right about sustainable growth rate, price really didn't matter. And where you're wrong about sustainable growth rate, you probably didn't buy cheap enough. And so for us, it's really about understanding, and that's why big markets matter because you can compound in a big market for a really long time. Uh, it's harder in a much smaller market to compound at a high growth rate. And sometimes in a rising market, all multiples get pulled up, even for companies that are in more limited markets. But you'd much rather pay the higher price for something that's in a significantly larger market where you have a chance of compounding for a long time. So then what of that sustainable growth rate? We've seen remarkable growth for certain segments of the space, courtesy of COVID, the enhanced digitalization that companies have had to do over the course of the last two years or so has really juiced the numbers on a lot of companies that provide that capability. But is it something that's sustainable post-COVID? Do you have to throw out your thinking on what constitutes sustainable growth rate pre versus post-COVID? Look, there are certainly certain companies that had a almost an unnatural you know, acceleration because of COVID, right? The best enterprise example of that would probably be Zoom. You know, the best consumer example of that might be Peloton. I'm, I'm not saying that the best examples, but the examples that everyone's heard of. In both cases, uh, the growth rate of those businesses uh, have declined pretty significantly since COVID has subsided. I won't say that COVID is gone, but this, since COVID has subsided. Uh, what we saw is that there's very few companies that had that type of acceleration, right? Where it was almost because all of a sudden behavior switched overnight uh, and it's switching back relatively quickly. What most companies saw, uh, particularly ones around collaboration and certain other tools that helped a, a companies be able to work in a code environment is we saw an acceleration of growth. But I think what you're seeing in a lot of those cases is, uh, let me use re return to work. So software applications that allow for remote collaboration, probably including Zoom are still going to be relevant because most firms are going back to a, a hybrid environment, not to a five-day-a-week work week. I mean, the five-day-away work week in the office is probably moving towards extinction. And we can debate whether that's good or not, but that's happening. And so that's going to force continued investment in tools around collaboration. Now, is it the extreme growth you know, that you had? No, but our company is going to have to continue to invest in tools like that. Yes. Um, and so what we think is that the positive benefit of COVID for technology growth is that I think companies realize that they're going to continue to need to have those types of tools. And if you look at kind of call it non-tech companies, you know, consumer companies, they understand that they're having a really strong digital channel is critically important. You know, Walmart probably put five years of investment into a year. So did that boost the spending of a bunch of companies? Sure. But as Walmart fundamentally view their digital channel as probably even more important than they viewed it pre-COVID? Yes. Is that going to lead to continued strong investment in their digital efforts? Yes. And I think you're seeing that across lots of industries. 
Parrick knows the secret to a great investable startup. And despite the worst health crisis in 100 years, he's witnessed what he calls the fastest deployment of capital in our history. And he doesn't remember a time in his career when he had quality companies growing at these rates. Some sectors are seeing five years worth of digitalization in a month. And while he admits the bubble of demand isn't likely to reinflate to the same degree, the long-term trends remain intact. This is great news for any company looking to scale up to meet demand. But what's Peric's secret to helping a company scale up? So one of the things about Insight that I think makes us unique uh, is that we have the largest number of employees is not actually on our investment team. Uh, the largest group of employees is in a group called Insight Onsite, uh, which is our kind of operations value add team. What my partner Hilly Gosher has built is a think of a software uh, organization and think about every functional area within a software organization: finance, sales, marketing, product, pricing. We have a team with an Insight that focuses on that area. And what do they do? What, what they do is they find all the best practices in that area, uh, both inside our portfolio and outside our portfolio, and frankly, the things that don't work, and codifies them, and then really shares that across our portfolio. We do a lot around customer introductions for our portfolio companies. We do a lot around talent recruitment for our portfolio companies. And we have teams that do each one of these areas. So what we say to people is, we're not just capital. You know, we're capital plus all this. So we believe we can be competitive on valuation, but then we can offer you this full suite of services that we think is pretty unique in the venture industry. You mentioned customer engagement as well as employee retention. How have your relationships with your companies evolved or changed because of COVID? It's, it's not like just walking into the office and sitting down with the CEO anymore. No, and I think that's been one of the more, you know, challenging things about COVID. You know, I, I was just yesterday visited a, a CEO, a, one of our portfolio companies is looking to acquire. And he, he made a funny comment to me. He was like, my existing investors never met me. And you're looking to acquire me. And you've met me before my existing investor who's looking to sell me has ever met me. And it was just like an interesting moment, kind of a sign of the COVID times. I, I'm sure, by the way, I have companies in my portfolio that are having that same kind of dynamic. And I think that we won't know for years what the impact of that is. But I think that there are things that you learn in person that you never learn. You know, sometimes people say to me, my wife sometimes asks me, like, with Zoom, like, why do you even have to go to board meetings anymore? And I said, well, it's really not the board meeting. It's, it's sometimes it's the dinner before the board meeting or the, you know, the drinks after the board meeting when you kind of have the casual conversation where you really learn things. And I think that one of the things that we miss by kind of selling deals on Zoom and closing deals on Zoom is that kind of personal relationship where you have kind of a reservoir of goodwill that gets tested at some point in every company. Every company has a challenge. And I think not having that kind of level of personal relationship will create risks. Now, most of these deals for all of us are relatively new. Uh, and so we haven't had to go through those challenges. But I think when we do, something will have been missed by not having been able to forge that same level of personal relationship. And I'm, and I'm excited that I'm now, we're, we're back in the mode of starting to meet you know, companies in person again. And I have to say, it's very energizing. Tell me how that goes down when that personal relationship is, as you called it, challenged. Well, you, you're always in a company, in almost every company, you're going to have a situation where there's a bump in the road. Uh, and that bump could be because of uh, a business problem. It could be because of a market issue that affects the performance of the company. And more often than not, there's some management challenge uh, you know, in the business. And sometimes that can create friction between you know, investors and, uh, you know, and a company. And I think that my experience has been when you, by the way, it just applies internally as well as a firm, right? I, what I, one of the things I've noticed is the ability to walk into somebody's office and talk through you know, a disagreement on a deal or a disagreement on an approach or on a hiring decision, that doesn't go as well on email and text. At a, another portfolio company where, you know, I thought there's a bit of a disconnect between the management team and the board. And what I 
uh, ended up having a dinner with management team. And in 15 minutes, we kind of resolved this supposed disagreement, which probably just wasn't really a disagreement. I just think people were talking, you know, past each other because uh, they hadn't really met in person in, you know, in over 18 months. So I just think that this in-person communications, I think people see it in their personal relationships as well, that uh, these, in, you know, in-person communications where you see people's body language and frankly, you have a little bit of um, unrelated chit chat to soften the conversation can really be dramatically more impactful than doing a session on Zoom. You once told me that you don't remember a time in your career when you had the quality of companies growing at the rates they're growing today during Corona Apocalypse 2020, 2021, 2022. Um, what is it about the quality? Like, why is it that in this weird environment in which we've been in for more than two years now, that's when you find the highest quality companies? It's a great question. I don't necessarily know that I know the answer, uh, but what I can say is that the, the friction you know, in some ways to raise a company has never been lower, right? The uh, ability to raise capital, uh, the ability to use uh, cloud and other third-party solutions to get a company up and running very quickly, the ability to frankly remote hire uh, and not have to be dependent on having talent be exactly where you're located. Um, all of these things kind of unlock value. And a confluence of all of that plus, I think, uh, recognition every year by a broader and broader set of companies that they're going to have to increase their investment in software, which is bringing more dollars you know, into the industry. You put all of that into uh, a soup and cook it. And I think you end up with a lot of really interesting companies. Do you think, say, 10 years from now, when we look back at COVID-19, that you'll be able to say you've never seen a boom quite like this? I, I really don't know, because I think... Uh, I don't know if that's going to end up being true. I think this ended up being a catalyst for investment for other reasons too, right? You also took the friction out of the investment process. It used to be before you close an investment, you had to fly to see the company and then you took them out to dinner. And it, the, just the process when you can do all of that in a Zoom, it's totally different. So uh, it's hard to know exactly what it is about this time that led to this activity. And these are some of the things, these are some of the ingredients, I think, that were uh, contributors for sure, but who knows what's next? Who knows what's going to happen next? And so I never like to say, yes, this will be the, this will end up having been the best time. By the way, valuations were also really high. So maybe we'll also look back and say, well, prices were high at that time as well. So I'm not one to predict that we can't have better times ahead. As countries worldwide cautiously lift COVID related protocols, the question becomes, where do the deep-pocketed investors like Insight Partners deploy cash next? Peric finds it's easier to invest in Canada than getting on a plane for a trip across the pond to the continent. He credits tax incentives dating back two decades that are still paying dividends today. But while Peric's eyeing opportunities in Canada, he is willing to get on a plane. Maybe if it lands him in India again. Well, with that in mind, I, I see that it looks like you've done more investing in Asia during COVID than you did before COVID. To what do you attribute that? And what does that investment trajectory look like post-COVID? Uh, well, that's true, what you just said. Uh, in, in our case, it's really particularly around India. You know, I think some of that came out of a focus on, it, it wasn't necessarily waking up and saying, COVID hit, we should go invest in India. I mean, that really wasn't the way it happened. You know, there are a couple of new markets that we're focused on, uh, fintech being one of them. And you know, one of the observations that we had as we started kind of looking at the fintech market is that we thought some of the most interesting innovation was happening outside of the US. We spent a lot of our time in fintech looking at companies in international markets, global markets, because their banking systems were not as evolved. And so the ability for the fintech industry to disrupt next generation financial services we thought was greater. India ended up being one of those markets where you know we saw a lot of opportunity in fintech. And then for the first time, one of the things we also saw the last few years in India is that historically, you know, India had been very strong in services, but they weren't necessarily strong in creating local intellectual property-based companies that were then s selling globally. But the development talent in India has always been very, very strong. And you know, what's happened over the last you know five, six years is you have a lot of 
software businesses being built in India with that exceptional engineering talent, and they're built, being built in ways that make sense to export globally. So we now have some pretty interesting investments of companies that were started in India. Oftentimes development is still in India, but they've now really become global companies. So I think, again, world is getting flatter when it comes to software. So what is an Indian company now, or what is a a Latin American company. I mean, sometimes it just means that a company was started there, but they went after global markets. So I think we'll continue to see opportunities in, in India. I think we'll continue to be active there. And, you know, we've made our first few investments in Africa and will that end up turning into more? I don't know. Uh, but there are so many of these markets where, you know, financial markets and, and software markets are still less mature than they are in other parts of the world but the need for them is no less. Uh, and so we think that there's a lot of opportunity for tech adoption growth in those markets. Let's come back home because you've said investing in Canada is easier than getting on a plane and traveling to Europe. What role has government played in making Canada an attractive place to invest? Well, you know, Canada historically, and I don't know exactly how it works today, but I remember when I joined Insight uh, back in 2000, Canada had put a... Um, tax credits in place to encourage there to be more software development in Canada. And generally, these were global companies who were getting tax incentives to put development talent in Canada. So I know a bunch of our portfolio companies did that. But what happens when you do that is you create an ecosystem of talent. Those companies exit, people leave, they form new companies. Where do they form those companies? You know, oftentimes where they live. Where is that? In that case, Canada. Uh, and so now, you know, you're seeing, you know, for example, just in our database, we're tracking over 6,000 companies in Canada in our space. 6,000 companies in Canada alone? 6,000 companies. Yeah. So that, if I, my guess, I don't have the data from, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Suffice it to say, it was a lot less. How much of that you can ascribe to some of the, the incentive systems that the government put in place. I don't know. I, I just don't have enough of the facts to be able to answer that. But I think any government that is putting incentives in place to uh, encourage more R&D to happen in their local market are likely going to reap dividends from it. You've said that industries that people perceive to be highly digital are not. And we're in the early stages of a multi-decade digital transformation. Where do you see the most opportunity for value creation? Even in industries where uh, they're viewed as highly software-intensive industries or highly dependent on software, the need for investment is really, really high. And then I think there are other industries where people don't realize how much software is in them. You know, the best one is really the automotive industry. Like most people don't realize the average car today has more software code than the average plane. Now we're seeing the downsides of that because what is that software sitting on? Well, it's sitting on chips. And where are those chips coming from? Well, they're coming from other parts of the world. They're not coming from anywhere right now. Right. They're not coming from anywhere right now. That chip supply has been disrupted and that's really had a huge impact on, you know, on the supply chain. You know, my own view is I don't think you can find an industry where the percentage, you know, the percentage of value over the next five years, the software percentage of value is not going up. It, it almost has to. And so I think that's what makes this such an exciting time, that it doesn't really matter which industry you pick. The industries that people don't at all perceive as software have a lot of software, and that software component is only going to continue to increase. So I think that the most exciting thing about what we do as uh, software investors is that there's a 10 to 20 year really strong secular growth rate that we're going to see, which is why another reason why I think we continue to see a lot of companies growing really quickly. I had seen a number that, that suggested that only one out of every four application workloads is currently done in the cloud, that most software is still run on individual machines, and that SaaS spend will quadruple over the next 10 years. Yeah, I, 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 there's so many different reports out on this. Um, and if you take the most conservative report or you take the most aggressive report, they're all talking about tremendous growth, right? Um, and I think that what what's happened is in the world we live in, software and technology companies, yeah, most of them are using the cloud already. 
And you know, cloud also needs to get defined in more than one way, right? There's the public cloud, but there's also private cloud, right? Where companies can still use a cloud application, but it's it's effectively their own cloud. Uh, so they're not kind of commingling uh, data. I think there's still a tremendous amount of growth uh, in cloud adoption uh, over the course of the next, again, you know, 10 to 20 years. So the growth rate, I mean, generally people have always underestimated growth rate in software, right? And if you go back and look at how big people thought salesforce.com could get 15 years ago, they were off by an order of magnitude. And one of the reasons for that was what cloud software did by bringing the price point down, by, by bringing implementation time down, making the software more easily implementable, it significantly increased the market size of the number of people who could use that software. And we're continuing to see that happen across so many vertical and horizontal applications. For the startup entrepreneur, if there was one takeaway you wanted them to leave with this conversation, what would it be? You know, I think it's like pick a problem you're really passionate about. You know, the, the temptation sometimes in markets like this, which, you know, can be frothy, is let me go pick the thing that, you know, is hot right now. You know, whether that's, you know, Web3 today or, you know, it, it was AI or ML, you know, a year ago. But, you know, my advice would be that, you know, markets get hot, markets get cold. Uh, but if you actually focus on a problem that you're really passionate about, you're more likely to really solve it and you're more likely to build a really big business. And while there'll be money that gets made in AI and ML, and there'll be money that'll get made in Web3 and the money that will get made in SaaS applications, money always gets made in applications that solve a really difficult pain point at scale. And if you pick something that you're really passionate about or know something about and you stick with it and you don't worry about what the hot thing of the day is or the hot thing of the week is, um, you know, that's probably the best road to success because I think oftentimes we find that, you know, companies are pitching themselves as something that they're really not because that's what they think investors want to hear. But fundamentally, solve a pain point, uh, get customers to buy your product, uh, get them to want to buy more of your product. That's the road to success. It's, it, it's so simple and yet many people don't follow it. Fascinating stuff. Thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you. Devin Perrick is the Managing Director of Insight Partners. Accelerating software revenue growth as we come out on the other side of COVID-19 requires you already have a product market fit and are engaging in best practices for sales, marketing, finance, and strategy. Focus on customer engagement and employee retention. Once we can confidently start taking potential clients out to dinner again, that tight sales pitch honed over the pandemic will pay dividends. And if you can sign them up to a recurring revenue model through a subscription, you may just get Peric knocking on your door. I'm Michael Hainsworth. Thanks for listening.